Hi, everyone. This is week nine, our final week, and we are going to be continuing to think about what do the world's religions have to offer when it comes to thinking about ecology. So we looked at Islam and the Quran, and now we're going to be turning to Christianity, um, and in particular, the Catholic Church. Um, the question that we're continuing to ask is, what exactly do we gain by looking to the past and drawing on resources of these religious traditions of the past? And something that you'll be asking and writing about for your final is, you know, is where do we go from here? With ecological change upon us, do we turn our back on the past and move forward? Or is there value and what is that value in looking to the past? And that's really an open question. Um, that I've wanted you to think about, and you can come to any answer that, that you like. Um, when it comes to Catholicism and Christianity as well, because the uh, person we're going to be talking about is really a, a, a person that transcends sects or denominations, um, we're going to be talking about St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, St. Francis was born in 1181 or 82, so 12th century. Um, then his life will go into the early uh, go into the 13th century. Um, he's from the city of Assisi, and this is a view from Assisi, the city that is behind me, a beautiful part of Italy. Um, it's in, if you just imagine Italy, if you see Italy and you kind of put your hand in what seems like the very geographical center of Italy, uh, you will be at Assisi. Um, it's a beautiful place, lots of olive groves, uh, it's kind of outside major cities like Rome, so it feels more simple and um, uh, more rural for for sure than uh, than Rome or Milan. Um, Assisi grew up in a merchant family and a very wealthy family. He loved uh, the pleasures of life, the luxuries of life. He walked around in fine clothes, um, and slowly he began to be drawn to something different. He saw the emptiness of that luxurious life and he renounced that luxury. Um, he would spend a lot of time, he began spending a lot of time on his own, meditating, thinking. Um, and there was one church, kind of a ruined church down in the plain where he would go and consider and, and, and ponder what, you know, his spiritual values. And it's there while he's in this ruined church uh, that he hears a voice, Francis, go and repair my house, which as you can see is falling into ruins. And so this is his beginning of his, of his work and his ministry is to literally repair this small church that's down in the plain. Um, and uh, he does that and he gathers people around him, but slowly it begins to dawn on him that this is a wider message. It's not about this tiny church down in the plain um, below Assisi, um, but rather it's about church with a capital C, that the, that the church has lost its simplicity of following its founder, Jesus, and he needs to repair the church as a whole. And so he begins um, gathers um, disciples around him. Um, he eventually gets permission from the Pope to found a religious order, the Franciscans, um, which is still around today. And um, uh, that uh, he travels around Europe and even goes into the Middle East preaching this gospel of simple following of Jesus. Um, of course, his father is going to disinherit him and strip him of his wealth, but that's okay. He doesn't want any of that. He's going to wear a, the plainest and simplest clothes um, in his, in his mission and take on poverty and beg for food. Um, now Francis is going to, as I've mentioned, follow found an order that's its first rule is simply to follow in the footsteps and teachings of Jesus. So of course we're in a, kind of a, a very complex Catholic, medieval Catholic world, and which is theologically and intellectually and materially advanced. And 
Francis is going to kind of draw back from that and follow the simple teachings of Jesus. You can turn to the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in the New Testament and see this kind of radical simplicity and radical teaching that he's going to make literal in his life. Um, now, this view of Jesus is important, right? And this is something you may not realize is, you know, we're surrounded by nativity scenes when it comes around to the Christmas season. Francis was the first person that we know of to make a nativity scene in the way that we recognize it, a simple manger, animals, and Mary in the middle, right? Um, he is the creator of that idea of the crash or the nativity scene. Um, that wasn't something that was always around in Christianity, but he saw something there that really spoke to the Christianity that he was trying to teach. And we, I mean, we're so, we see these things so often, maybe we don't think about what that means, but to see Jesus as a helpless child and a child in the most simple of places, this, this manger with no wealth or luxury around, and then surrounded by animals, you know, and there's, you can always see all these, and you know, cows and sheep and cattle, what have you, kind of surrounding the baby Jesus. That this is an ecological Jesus, and it's something that I think we're we we pass over very quickly. But the the possible teaching value and beauty of the nativity scene. Um, you also you always see um, uh, garden statues of Francis, often holding a lamb. There's someone here in our neighborhood, for example, who has this little statue. And you may think, well, that's just a cute statue, but that is St. Francis. He's kind of the saint the, of, um, uh, the, of ecology. That's kind of what he's been made by the um, Catholic Church. So there's like this natural affinity of Francis to the natural world, to the extent that when it comes to little garden statues, you'll often see Francis with this kind of brown tunic and then holding an animal. And that's not just a fun depiction, but is a, an expression of uh, what's fitting religiously for thinking about nature and the um, uh, and, 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 and for nature and this religious tradition. Um, uh, let me um, turn now to some images. Uh, this is from Assisi, uh, and you can see kind of the legacy of Francis here in Assisi. Give me just a sec. Okay, um, this is where you see Francis today in Assisi. And remember I mentioned that he would go down into the plain, there was a ruined church, and he saw it as his first mission was to repair this ruined church. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of funny in some ways, but they, they have, that church is now this kind of Francis relic. So they've taken the church that he originally repaired, and then they built a massive church around it. So I guess that's what happens to all messages of simplicity. Um, is they get incorporated into very non-simple structures. Um, and there's this an extent to which the teaching of St. Francis, this is emblematic of the way the teaching of St. Francis, the radicalness of it has been lost in some ways within the church. But part of um, the message that I want in this lecture and in this class is to say, well, these things can be reactivated as well. If we move forward towards that church, um, uh, this place, this is a sacred place, right? There's, this is Francis and the extent to which Francis is a saint and his presence in the past in this place makes this sacred. Moving up back onto the mountain, away from the plain, we get the churches that were built in the decades really following the death of St. Francis. He's immediately recognized as a saintly figure, stories, um, mythical stories really grew up around him. Um, and those are great to read. Um, but this is the, uh, the, the large uh, church that is now at the center of the memory of St. Francis. As you go into this church, you have a beautiful set of murals from Giotto, a Renaissance, early Renaissance painter. Um, 
almost pre-Renaissance actually. And you get the scenes from the life of St. Francis that are, that are depicted here. Um, one of the most famous scenes about St. Francis is his preaching to the birds. And let me just talk for a moment about this, is that the gospel that St. Francis was preaching was he recognized as not being solely for other human beings, but it was a gospel for creatures, for the earth, for anything that lives. And so he would he famously preached to the birds. And then painters, of course, love this scene because here's Francis um, and all the birds are sitting there listening to his sermon. But I think there's something that's very interesting about that, a sense that this is a message, this simplicity and, and um, uh, voluntary poverty uh, is connected to the earth and is, is a gospel for the earth. And that's something um, that I think we can uh, take to heart as well. One of the things I'd like you to read is the Canticle of Brother Son, which I put a link to on our Moodle page. And this is for, by St. Francis, and this gives a sense of this kind of um, the connection of the natural world to uh, St. Francis and how he wanted to see the natural world as his brother and sisters, not as separate and apart from human experience, but uh, kind of part of the human, part of our brotherhood or community. Now, you know, part of the thing to wonder when you read that Canticle of the Sun is how does that compare to Darwin, right? I mean, Darwin has, I think, at heart an ecological vision, but it's also one that recognizes the otherness of the natural world. And that's something maybe to wrestle with is to what extent is that dark green religion that we're seeing reflected in Wilson and Darwin compatible with this almost childlike embrace of the natural world that we see from St. Francis. Can these things be brought together? Um, another story that's very popular about St. Francis and maybe part legendary is the Wolf of Gubbio. Um, and so in this case, there's a wolf that's kind of terrorizing a town and they're gonna kill the wolf. And St. Francis says, no, no, no. And St. Francis goes out and the wolf charges at him but recognizes that Francis is not someone that he should eat. And so he listens to St. Francis and then there's this deal where the wolf won't kill anybody or any animals and he'll be fed by the town. And so the wolf of Gubbio becomes a peaceful member of the world. Um, so uh, this is another kind of example of the way there's this ecological vision. But again, it's not one that's necessarily realistic that wolves eat creatures, there's a violence in the world. And this Darwinian view that we get of the tangled bank acknowledges the kind of death and, and, and destruction that is a part of the natural world. And it feels to some extent like Francis is kind of rolling back that um, view of, of the violence and death that's part of the nat natural world. Now, on death, Francis does, he at the end of this Canticle of the Sun, you'll see that he calls brother death, right? He praises God for and addresses brother death as part of the natural world. So it's not a, it's not a denial of death, but, um, but it's also a, maybe a sense of uh, that, it, that the violence of the world could be different. Uh, here are these early images of St. Francis that are in this church. Um, and I, I won't go too far into that, but you'll notice on his hand, there's a mark. And on his side, there's a mark. And Francis, at the, toward the end of his life, received the stigmata, which is these marks, which were kind of miraculously given to him where he had um, the mark of the crucifixion on his palms, and then where on his side, a slit where he was, where the place where Jesus was, um, was stabbed when he was on the cross. So these are these marks of Jesus. Now this is a kind of miraculous side. We can, currently, we won't necessarily find this that attractive, this kind of way of thinking about the body and the marks of Jesus literally on the body. But if you think about Francis's message of literally following Jesus and putting his words into action, then why he would be marked with the signs of Jesus um, might become more clear. Uh, if you visiting that church in the in the base in the the crypt of the church are um, where francis is buried and along with some of the early um saints the followers of saint francis 
uh, and this is uh, a kind of relic or um, sacred space that many people visit as pilgrims to be close to uh, where Francis uh, was buried. Other relics as well, like um, uh, the tunics that were worn by his brotherhood that remain. You know, you, you can tell that immediately after his death, everything connected to Francis was saved and, and had some kind of holy um, value to it. Uh, and these are on display for contemporary pilgrims. And here's some more of these, of these garments, these simple garments that were part of his look. And what was, was this part of the message itself was the clothes that he wore. You know, much like Gandhi wearing simple cloth and there's a kind of look that Gandhi came to uh, and that projected a view of the world from his, the, the images of himself. You know, Francis had something similar with coming from a wealthy merchant's family that sold clothes, luxury clothes. This is the way he rejected that world. I think there's a challenge here towards capitalism and um, uh, the kind that world uh, that he comes from. Here is the uh, the the order, the headquarters of the order in Assisi. You can see the church up on top, but then massive space around it, which you can't really visit. But this is where the Franciscan monks, uh, a large monastery um, that works and continues to this to this day. So this is someone who is uh, by no means forgotten, not some kind of leftover corner of the um, Christian church and faith, but something that is right there on the surface can be grabbed hold of and made present and maybe the implications um, uh, 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 opened up. Um, let me go back, leave these images. Okay, um, so what I'm, there's two other readings that you have. Um, the, the Canticle of Brother Son, which is by St. Francis, short poem, but shows his view of the natural world. And then also 20 pages of the um, Laudato Si, which is a um, encyclical by the current Pope Francis, um, who took his name, you know, when you become Pope, you get to choose your name. And he chose Francis in harking back to St. Francis that this is the person that he wanted to kind of represent his, um, uh, his spirit as Pope. And this is Laudato Si is his statement on ecology. And I don't know if um, everyone knows the extent to which this Pope is um, friendly towards environmental questions, but read these 20 pages. And in it, you'll see reference to St. Francis, of course, um, but you'll also see um, where are exactly the bridges that we can make with uh, large religious traditions like the Catholic Church. And just like we thought about Islam last time, there are these ways that um, as we're facing a new world and the rising uh, waters of climate change is our book that we'll discuss on Friday say, to what extent can we grasp backwards for a hand from these religious traditions? Um, so read what, read what the Pope says. And that's what I'm gonna have you respond to is, um, uh, is this statement by, uh, the Pope, and what is there that that seems to reflect the ecological thought that we're talking about, and what is there that is maybe a difference. Okay, I'll talk to you all soon.